Hi there, I'm Tom Hoskins, editor of Mining Journal, and I'm here with Ryan Melser, who's the Chief Technology Officer at American Battery Metals Corporation. Ryan was the former research and development, ma uh, development manager for Tesla's Gigafactory Battery Materials Processing Division. Um, during his time at Tesla, Ryan founded and led a cross-functional team of mechanical and chemical engineers who implemented first principles design to develop novel first-of-a-kind systems for the extraction, purification, and synthesis of, and of precursor and active battery materials. Uh, his background is in chemical engineering, also with a business degree, and his, he's focused his career on developing first-of-kind technologies. Um, so, Ryan, American, American Battery Metals Corporation is, um, is really focused on the process of deconstructing batteries and re recycling batteries, but also on the extraction of primary metals. Um, but I'd like to start off talking a little bit about the recycling side of things because it's not something that we've covered much at Mining Journal. Um, could you talk a little bit about your technology and how it differs from current technology in the market? Yes, of course, and thank you for having me here. But when you look globally as far as the recycling of lithium ion batteries, the vast majority of existing facilities operate in, in Asia and specifically China. And they tend to use very similar technologies where they will take an entire battery pack or a module or cells and put it through a high temperature furnace essentially to oxidize many of the liquid organic carbonates within the battery cell to oxidize many of the carbon graphite anode materials and to essentially make the battery inert and easier to process downstream. But that's a relatively expensive system to operate it puts large amounts of pollutant emissions in the air. The species of, of fluorine and phosphorus can form very polluting and toxic materials that then need to be scrubbed out of that exhaust stream. And downstream, the materials are centered together and it makes it much more difficult to separate them in physical manners. And if you go through a conventional smelting pathway, it makes it difficult to recover each of those elements in high recovery efficiencies. So because of that, many of those facilities throughout the world don't operate especially profitably, or they actually need to be paid a, a tipping fee to be paid to take waste material away from companies or consumers. And because of that, it really puts a disincentive on those materials from re-entering the market to really make this battery supply chain system a closed loop. So what we've done differently at American Battery Metals is really we don't use any type of brute force method like that. We do not have any high temperature operations. We don't simply dissolve the entire battery in a strong acid. Instead, because my background and that of my team is really in the design of the manufacturing processes of lithium ion batteries. And like you mentioned, you know, starting very early at the Gigafactory near Reno, designing how to actually manufacture these batteries, how to commission those production lines, how to decrease the defects and the manufacturing yield losses per stage. We've designed what we call a demanufacturing process, where within a matter of minutes, we can essentially take a full battery pack or set of modules or cells and physically deconstruct them in a strategic manner to physically separate them into scrap metals into high metal uh, powder materials and then go through a much more strategic method of extracting each of those elements. And because we have this purpose-built system, we have significantly lower capex per throughput, much lower operating costs, and we're able to extract many more elements and a higher recovery efficiencies than existing processes. And that allows us to operate with a significantly higher margin where we are not required to actually have companies pay us to take their waste away. And that really is encouraging and enabling so much more of this waste and end of life material to come back to us and to go back in the market in a circular fashion. Okay, so, I mean, I guess from, from our point of view, you know, we, we write a lot about um, battery metals and, you know, this electric vehicle revolution that um, has been sort of, slightly well I suppose people say different things about what's happened since COVID but I mean you know auto sales have gone down but you know this sort of switch certainly in Europe to a, a greener 
um, you know, to, to greener technologies and, you know, there's been a real focus on, on electric vehicles. Um, I mean, how soon, you know, might a technology like yours start to sort of factor into, you know, the battery side of things on, on an automotive, um, on the automotive side? It's a very gradual um, step for actually taking these battery metals and returning them back into the market. And in every unit of recycled metal we send back in the market displaces one unit of otherwise sourced virgin metal. And the other part, like I mentioned, of many existing processes right now, they're only able to recover those elemental metals and purify them up to industrial grade. And many of them tend to be sold back into you know, the stainless steel alloy market or the grease and ceramics market and don't actually make it all the way back into the battery supply chain. And even though those materials are technically recycled, they really don't end up displacing battery grade metals that are in the existing supply chain. So as we work through that over the next few years, the rate will increase exponentially. Early on, a lot of our feed comes from consumer electronic type batteries, smartphones and laptops and tablets, and a very large amount from defects and manufacturing losses at cell and active material manufacturing sites. And as more and more electric vehicles start coming back from the market, that will also start to make an increasing percentage of our feed. So, I mean, I guess if we take a step back and, you know, just bring in your, your background at Tesla, um, from, from, from what I understand, you know, you, you effectively, you know, sort of began the process of your technology or, or developing it at Tesla and since leaving you've, you've you've continued on that on that journey um i mean from what you say it sounds like you know recycling is not something that the auto guys like tesla are thinking about in the sort of you know short to midterm it's a it's a longer term it's a longer term play but i mean a company like tesla it really surprises me that they're you know that they're not looking to develop it now given that they're you know leading the way on, on evs i mean do, do you think this is going to come back to bite them in the years to come? The consensus now is that all of the major vehicle OEMs are much more focused on increasing the throughput on the manufacturing side because the industry is still so supply limited. That's really where all their resources are being applied right now to scale up that throughput as much as possible. So again, even the other US and European and Asian based recyclers, really tender automakers, seem to think that it's really not until end of life vehicles start coming back that they really need to focus on this type of, of technology. They're, they're correct that that's when the throughput will grow dramatically, but you really don't want to wait until the throughput demand is really there before you start trying to develop a technology. So the plant we're building now, we're calling our first commercial pilot facility. It'll have a capacity of about 20,000 metric tons per year of feed material. That'll make it one of the largest lithium ion battery recycling plants in the world, but it's still very small compared to the cell manufacturing capacity. And if we're ever going to move to a closed loop supply chain, the throughput of the manufacturing and the demanufacturing sites will have to be equal. So many of the large OEMs, yes, they are trying to wait for the commercial implementations and are not putting resources into the development at this stage. And each company has to make their own decisions, but, but we've really chosen to focus on this right now to scale up our operations in the near term and to really fill the void that exists in this industry. Yeah, but, but of course you're, you're also into the extracting side of, you know, you're into the mining side as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that fits alongside recycling? Yes, it's, it's always surprising to me how few companies really understand the synergies of doing both of those together. When you look at either the recycling or the primary metal extractions, you know, roughly the, the first third of those processing trains are really tied to the type of feedstock you're using. But once you get towards the middle and back end of those processes, once you're down to leachate, to leach liquor solutions, when you're going through aqueous purifications, when you're going to back end, you know, hydroxide and sulfate conversion processes, and especially the, the laboratory analytics, the quality control, the supplier relations, all those completely overlap, whether you're starting with recycled material or virgin material. 
So us being able to spread out our R&D resources and potentially even some of our larger capital equipment to do the backend processing from both recycled material and virgin material is, is showing huge gains in doing that in a much more synergistic design. And while the, the occupied mass of batteries in the field is going to continue to grow for many years, potentially decades, even with a 100% recycling recovery efficiency, we will keep having to add new material to that closed loop as it continues to grow. So both recycling and harvesting of elements from virgin feedstocks are required in order to support this industry. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, as you say, it is, it is surprising that there aren't more people kind of thinking of covering those two, two bases. Um, I, I just wondered if, if you've got any figures to hand on or forecasts for how much, how much um, you know, the recycling side of things will impact on demand for for battery metals further down the road, I'm thinking, you know, towards the end of this decade or early 2030s, I guess when, you know, the first sort of round of EVs are, you know, are, are being scrapped or are coming off the road. Right, so the, the throughput of recycling facilities is growing extremely quickly, but the cell manufacturing site is also growing extremely quickly. So within the next 10 years, we're forecast to see over a tenfold growth and the annual manufacturing capacity of lithium ion battery cells. So it's more of you know, chasing a moving target. The recycled generated materials will continue to grow as we move forward, but they'll continue to be only a moderate percentage of total supply, really until we get to the top end of that S-curve. And again, the total amount of EVs and stationary storage systems on the road starts to plateau. And that's really when the generation of recycled material starts catching up and we don't have to add quite as much, you know, virgin materials into that loop. Okay, um, just a final one. Um, I was just intrigued to, to know how um, leaving Tesla and going to work for a startup, you know, how, how the two sort of compare. And, um, and I feel like, you know, Tesla, you're, you, know, you must have had a lot of resources at your fingertips to, you know, a lot of the smartest guys in the room type thing to develop this this tech like how's it been sort of going out on your own i guess uh, i mean the answer is yes and no but when i joined tesla back at the start of 2015 you know i, I specifically joined the, the gigafactory team so at that point we hadn't even broken ground on the facility it was still a patch of dirt out in the desert so there were only about a dozen of us that formed you know the, the gigafactory team we were really the only people in Nevada. The vast majority of the company was still down in, in the San Fran Bay area. So we pretty much felt like a startup company. We happened to be within a larger company umbrella, but those early days, we were very much a, a scrappy startup company. You know, when I left, I feel like there were, I think a few days, there were over 10,000 people on site at Gigafactory, whereas early on, there were a few dozen. So we really did grow as a startup into a much larger established entity within a larger company. And that's that's what we're doing here. You know, I, I really do enjoy first of kind systems design, you know, the rigorous modeling, the building of lab scale units, the validation of benchtop units, evolving that technology up to first of kind pilot units, and then building larger commercial systems. And then once the system is more mature and you're going through incremental improvement, I mean, I generally prefer to then start over again with a brand new technology and go back to a blank page again. So it, it feels great to be at the start of that curve again and just have so much opportunity in front of us. Excellent. Well, yeah, it sounds like you've got a seriously, seriously exciting few years ahead of you. So, um, you know, good luck with that. And um, hopefully we will speak again soon. But for now, um, that is all we've got time for. So thank you, uh, viewers, for joining us. and. Um, we will see you again soon. Bye-bye. Great to speak with you. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan.